Hato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Okay, so I called Venerable earlier today and I said, we've never done it this way, but when I go back to the beginning of Dhammasukha Meditation Center uh, on the mountain in um, Lesterville, the first location that we were at, okay, um, this is going to drive me crazy. Just one second here. Um, I know how to do this. Hold on. There. Okay. Um, one of the things that we um, What we did in the very first Yahoo group that we had, I started it in 2003. And, it, and the question that came up eventually was about uh, how many leaves did the Buddha have in his hand when he was talking to the monks. And there were all kinds of funny little things about this. There's story goes that he was in the forest with the monks and they approached him and said, Lord, we would like to have all of the knowledge and the wisdom that you have. And the Buddha's answer to them at that time, the Buddha's answer to them was all of the, uh, all of the knowledge that I have and all of the wisdom I have, if you look around you in the forest, is like all of the leaves on the forest floor. That's the statement. But then he leans over and he picks up with his hand, he picks up a bunch of leaves and turns it over and he says, but the leaves in my hand are all that you need in this lifetime in order to accomplish your objective, which was to experience the super mundane Nibbana and to open the mind fully. Now let's talk about Nibbana for a second. When I'm sketching the way this is happening, it occurred to me I missed something when I was drawing this for you before. But let me show you what happens when you fall, when you when you, when you're working on this. That's if you can open this up. <laughs> um, okay, there. Okay. Um, the, whoops, I did it, I'm sorry. I usually show it to you where you're moving along a line and you're going through the jhanas and then when you get through all these jhanas that on the line, you cross over this last line into cessation. And the where cessation, when I draw it, I usually draw it like this, you fall over because each one of these, if you've seen me draw the waterfall, you notice that each one of these is like tumbling down into the next waterfall like this. And then the water, the waterfall fills up. And then when it's time, the conditions are right, you fall over into another and another and another and another until you get to the eighth one. That point when you cross over into cessation, you fall down to cessation, which is turning off. Now, my own, my, you know, many of us have had this happen a number of times as we go through different levels of, of attainments as we're going along. Okay. And when this happens, it's like a closing off, a shutting down that is very quick that happens of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And then it turns back on. So when I say that you turn off, Remember that when you're in the eighth level here, or the, the seventh level is nothingness, okay? And the eighth one is neither perception nor non-perception, okay? That's what this one is. There's nothing going on there. Everything, you have let go, you have stepped back, you have left the building. There's nothing going on except watching in this very calm state 
and some people can do this for hours and there's nothing disturbs them at all, but they still have a good attention, a gentle attention, not a pinched or pressured or tension type attention, but a very clear observation just of just watching in the darkness, okay? Now, you have emptied a lot along the way through the, for, through the, the Rupa Janus back here and you for the Arupa Janus here, you have emptied, emptied, emptied. That's a big job. And then when you get here, you fall off, there's nothing. So if I say that cessation, it's not only cessation, but it's like you have, everything shuts down and it's like turning out the lights. Okay, that's a good way to describe it, right. But something happens that is um, when you come and turn back on again, when you turn back on, dependent origination happens very quickly. And those 12 links come up and they turn back on. And then when they come back on, then there's a big op opening thing that occurs. Okay, now in trying to explain to anyone what this opening is, that's one of the reasons I'm very strict about saying this is an experience of Nibbana. It's not, I have reached Nibbana. I have attained it. I got it because I'm gonna stay there. That's not it either. Because in the, in the um, attainments themselves, if you remember, you have Satipatthana, then you have Satipatthana in fruition, you have Sakatagami, you have Sakatagami and fruition, you have Anagami, and you have Anagami and fruition, right? You have Arahat, and then you have Arahat and fruition. Look at that. Now, over, over, over the line of history, was, these were pretty clear in the beginning, but over the line of history, when they weren't happening as easily anymore, certain things were said about them that are not in the text. For instance, that when Sotapanna happens, that the idea is the fruition part, the fruition will happen immediately. That's not true. We've witnessed that this isn't true with hundreds and hundreds of people now that the sotapanna is one thing, the, so the fruition happens as a separate thing. And each time this happens, this happens where you fall down and you come out and come up again. So this is a series of how many times this actually happens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times to get to the super mundane, last one, finished completely, utterly done, arahat with fruition, okay? So taking that idea, what I'm curious, always been curious about is what in the world happens when you fall into cessation and when you come back out and this opening happens. So when you open your eyes and get up from your practice and start to walk, everything is different. What is that? So what I fail to say to people many times is, that this is like, like I, I have said to you, it's like having a baby and you have to take care of it because I'm not gonna take care of it for you and nobody else is gonna come take care of it for you. You have to take care of it for yourself. If you don't take care of it, it can slip away from you and deteriorate and diminish and dilute itself and disappear, especially if you don't have the fruition to hold it, help hold it in place. But you have to be careful of these, okay? The point is you emptied when this happened. And I'm very curious as to, I don't know, I'm gonna to start to try to do some research to find out if anybody has done any research where someone has been wired up at that point to tell me what exactly, we know it's a shutdown and then it's a turn back on where you see the brain waves happening and, and the shutdown is very, very brief, okay. But look at the idea of your head has emptied out of everything that you've forgiven, everything you've let go of, everything, there's absolutely no other hindrances coming up when you're in the bottom levels of your practice. So you're clean. 
And that's the reason everything is working in the body because of the connection with the mind and the body that your eyesight would change and your hearing would sharpen and your, uh, your faculty of smelling would get extremely sharp and taste would be utterly completely, uh, re it's, it's very remarkable because you can sometimes tell all the parts of your tongue for sour, for salt, for sugar, for this, for that, you know, and it's very, that's a very strange experience. And these can last a very, very short time in the beginning. And then they lengthen as you experience this type of thing happening again. That's what I mean by how delicate this is as far as when it occurs, okay? Um, this condition is also subject to a Nietzsche, you see? But the, the reason that you are able to take a look at some of the potential of the human being that you didn't have access to before, you could not experience, um, what they call uh, divine eye or divine ear or div you know the sharpening of the sense doors to the extreme. What does that mean anyway? It means your, your eyes look across a ravine and see a bird's nest and four baby birds in it that is way, way, way far away. And you can see perfectly sharp, this is very strange, okay? Or you can hear something from a great distance, you might be riding a bike um, on bike trails and then you go through a park, but you hear, hear a discussion. And if you stop very carefully on the bike and you listen to what you're hearing, you can't see anybody in the immediate vicinity that is saying what you're hearing and you keep looking. You might find somebody across the other side of a park, a field in a park, and realize they're, do, they're the ones that are saying that. If you were to ride over there and get closer, you would be amazed to find that you were hearing this big distance away. But then these don't things, these don't last, you know. Why don't they last is because habitually you're back in the world and you start filling this up again or recalling things that you let go of while you were practicing. So should we get disappointed about this or get down about it? And the, the answer is no. We just need to understand how this is all working. And it makes perfect sense uh, the way we see the, uh, the way the operation of the um, experience of the Nibbana, the opening of the mind, and it's into almost a baby's mind, if you will. It's a, you retain all of your speech, you retain all your dictionaries, you retain everything and access to that. But you have this experience that is so remarkable, like it reminds you of your own child carrying the child under a year old and having them go out in the springtime, the baby sees a tree and sees a leaf on the tree and is fascinated by just one leaf. They never saw a leaf before. They never realized a tree had leaves before. And the baby gets excited. And if you watch babies start to learn speech, look at how amazed they are at everything. We ca I call this wonderment. This is the wonderment of the nursery school. And as older people, we have lost the wonderment, that experience in our life of wonderment, you see? And um, why? Because this is so crowded and, and um, so full. The wonderment's been pushed back underneath everything that's in your head, squashed to the bottom, and maybe there's a tiny little, tiny little seed left there. And the neat part is if you go through some kind of an opening that occurs, that little seed is still in there. And when you start looking, your energy also, it, it's, a, it's an example of the connection between the body and the mind and the uh, energy that you can have. This energy that you can have coming out and maybe after that happening, you wanna get on a bike and you wanna ride for 15 or 20 miles and you're not even tired. You're not tired at all and you come back and then you sit again and start sitting. And then you can maybe have that happen again and go through fruition or maybe the fruition will take time and then it'll happen later on. So these are all interesting things to consider how all this works. 
But if we look at the core of what the Buddha was teaching, he was teaching to examine very closely how the mind works in cooperation with the body, the mind-body connection, and, and how different it is if we stay on the side of um, the wholesome nature instead of the unwholesome nature. And that's one of the reasons the Eightfold Path is, is part of the 37 requisites. So what we're going to do, uh, I had I, I started by saying we started that um, the first discussion group on Yahoo years ago, and we got to this place where we were fascinated by how many leaves were in the Buddha's hands when he was in the forest. And he said that to the monks, you know, all, all the leaves that I have in my hand are all that you need. And having lived in a forest that was like the one behind me, it's a hardwood forest, but there are pine here. Missouri was, this is in Missouri where the center is. And there were nothing but pines and they came and cut the pines down. They planted hardwoods. They have this variation of different kinds of trees now there. Not so healthy because it was a pine forest, but when you look on the ground in Missouri, you might find leaves that are the size of my finger that are willow leaves from a willow tree. Or you might find a leaf that is like this big. And certainly in Asia, we have this issue where I have seen the elephant plant where the leaves are this big in the jungle, you see. People put them out in front of their house and they grow them to block the view, you know. So obviously it wasn't an elephant leaf he had in his hands. The question for these stories is what kind of leaf did he have in his hand? And, and how many leaves were in his hand? And then we all got curious and I said, well, let's start by figuring out what those leaves might have been. We're, gonna, we're not gonna do that right now. We're gonna do go just to the 37 requisites of enlightenment. We, we talked in the beginning when I was teaching, when COVID started, we started teaching the foundation series for a long time. But what we didn't do is we never got to the part in the, in the uh, foundation series where we took the 37 uh, requisites for awakening and, and we uh, sent that paper out to you. You should have gotten it. I'm hoping that you did before doing this tonight. And when you see the 37 requisites, let's see if I can pull that up. I think I can. Okay. Um, we start by looking at them and we start going through how those are working. This is not right. Um, let me go right to that. This is easy. We will go to the encyclopedia, right. And it's up near the top because it's a number. So it's 37 requisites. And this is interesting because Bhante always wants you to, and I think I gave you this one. Did I win it? This one, I think, yeah. This is the first one that I'm giving you. And, and this one is um, one that was um, developed. I, I have to go back now, wait a minute. Okay, I have to go back to you guys. And now I have to go in here. So when we look at what I sent you, whoops, I don't want the whiteboard. I hope it doesn't do that here. I want this. This is what Erwin Jensen did for us. He was one of the original six people that were working with Bonte. And I want to teach them to you a particular way. I want to teach you in a way where you learn them as four, four, five, four, five, seven, eight. The reason I'm showing you is that, um, so I, I reset this up this time when I went in this document because you always see it in the book as four, 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 five, five, seven, eight, and that's 37. But what we realized after a couple years, we realized that that shouldn't be in that order, <laughs> okay? That these things come up naturally for you to think about or consider or learn about, but the way that they come up and appear as you're learning about all of this 
they come up as four foundations of mindfulness, then four bases of spiritual power, and then five spiritual faculties. And then, um, oh, is that right? No, just five. Yeah, okay, five faculties. I don't know why he said spiritual, but they're five faculties. And then um, four kinds of right effort. And then I put the word striving in here because this is important to understand. There's not a contradiction in Bhikkhu Bodhi's book. There's a reason for this. Um, there's two groups in this list that they start out one way, but then they turn into powers. The first one you'll notice is faculties and powers. When we look at those, we see the same exact words, but the faculties, when we first learn about them, we're learning our meditation and we know that we should keep an eye on how, what the condition of each one of the faculties is while we're practicing. Because if something is causing us problems or going wrong, we want to check on those faculties and see if we have doubt about it or we're not quite, they're not quite balanced or whatever. And then suddenly those faculties, as we get our practice going, will happen automatically. And when they balance automatically, then they're called five spiritual powers, okay? So these are levels of development of the faculties, okay? One is you're, you're balancing them and the five powers are happening automatically. Mind is taking care of it. Then four kinds of right effort, it turns into four kinds of striving, okay? So that sounds like um, all we found out that what the striving is, it's just the same thing as the faculties turning into powers, the four kind, steps of right effort. And these, I, I wouldn't have said this, but I mean, when he did it way back then, this was done in 2003, he said kinds of right effort, but there are four steps of one practice. And that's what we know the six R's are based on the four steps of right effort. And then the next one is uh, seven factors of awakening. And Bhante is really strict about saying awakening and not saying enlightenment. And the reason is for this is because if I tell you something, it's pretty simple. If I tell you something you've never heard about before and I learned something from you today, you have enlightened me by telling me something I didn't know before. So the enlightenment has to do with the comprehension of the Dhamma and the knowledge building, okay? That's what the enlightenment is. But awakening was what the Buddha did. And uh, his awakening by becoming the arahat with fruition, when he reached that state, of where everything I just described to you was emptied out of the head for a period of time. And it's up to you how you take care of it. And this is one of the reasons monastics, when they're in temple environments supporting each other and they're, the temple is dedicated to meditation. By the way, all temples are not dedicated to having space for doing meditation. Um, and that's something I've learned over the time traveling. And, and uh, my teacher used to explain to me, you know, if a monk, a monks are very lucky, the male monks, because if they go to one temple and they love to chant and the temple is a temple where people are chanting all the time, you, that they love to be there. Another place they'll go to is they're really into printing books and circulating and preservation and teaching or, or pr preservation ma mainly. And the Thai temples are really great with this because in most of the Thai temples across the United States, the big temple is there, but right behind the altar, there's another room. And the other room is the printing place where they print their own books and pamphlets and small books and large books and everything. And so monks would come to become a monk and be involved in that for the preservation work for the rest of his life. That's his Dhamma duty, you see? And that's fantastic. And then another one might be the discussion of the Dhamma and the practice and actuation of that Dhamma, a mixture of open discussion about the 
um, the text and their meanings and application like in our tradition and everybody there is doing that so we all get along and there's no conflict then you go to another one and uh, they are the builders and the Thai monks are very strong and they come and they tear down the fence between the temple and the next lot that the abbot bought and they remodel the houses and rebuild them. And when they're finished, they go to another place to do that as well. And they keep doing that while the whole time they're monks. And they're also chanting and they're also uh, learning basic things that could help with your learning basic things, but that's what they want to do for the rest of their life. So they have all these options. When you look at the nuns, we don't have a lot of options. We don't. And in different countries, it's getting better now where we have more options of where we can go to live or how we can decide to live. Um, but it's very difficult because the respect for the nun, the respect for the treatment of the nun and the living conditions for the nuns and stuff are not always great when you go temple to temple and many temples have no space for a nun. And you don't want to stay in the Vihara with the monks. You want to be in a separate place from where they are. So it's very, uh, it's a young revival of the nuns still considered that way, unless they go to nunneries, but moving around and uh, it's not the same experience at all. So the factors, when we look here, are the factors of awakening get to be real important because these things have to come into uh, balance in conjunction with your meditation practice, okay? And um, hold on just a second. I don't wanna miss the water, hold on. I know that probably sounded a little strange to you, but you should feel very lucky if the water's in your house. <laughs> For me, I have to catch it every day as it comes in, turn it on. But once again, we're very fortunate that we have this system where I am is in other places, um, it's a bucket system or it's a jug system getting water to where you are. So it's big variation wherever you're gonna live. Okay, so the seven factors are directly tied in to uh, factors of awakening or uh, those, those enlightenment factors, however you wanna talk about those. They're directly tied in for the balance in your meditation practice so that you can reach the end of the development line. Okay, and then the eightfold, so the Noble Eightfold Path. More and more when I look at this, I see the structure as a um, support system for the development. It is part of the training itself, but we have to be very careful about the eightfolds of the Noble Eightfold Path. Because why? Because when we're looking at it as a, as a, uh, as the folds of something. I had this image today and I started giggling about it because I had the image of buying a sheet that was an eight fold sheet. And so um, I bought the sheet and I brought it home. It's just in daydream in my mind. And I opened up the package and eight pieces of cloth fell out on the floor in eight separate pieces. Of course, I couldn't use it to make the bed. So I ended up using it as dust rags maybe or something like that, <laughs> okay? But when, you, when you're talking about eight folds of something, you literally have to understand that it's like the eight folds in a fan. And I was intrigued by this because you can take a piece of paper like this, okay? And fold it in half, okay, like this. And, um, you know, when we talk about the Nibbana, the experience of Nibbana, we're talking about the cooling, the cooling of the mind, the turning off, complete turning off of the heat of craving. So now I have this folded like this, and then I'm gonna fold it in half again like this. 
And I'm going to put it like that. This is something you can do with the kids in Sunday school, and they begin to get it really quickly. All right, once I once I fold it in half like this again, get it right. Okay, and crease it really tight. Then you fold it one more time. So I have it like this. Now I'm going to fold it one more time like this. Okay, and when I fold it like this, what is the issue with doing this is I'm trying to get across my point that you cannot just chop up the eightfold path and say that when you're practicing meditation. Now we've done these three already, so we don't have to worry about them. We only have to worry about five. So we're going to experiment with that. Okay, so now I have this piece of paper. Now I'm going to open it up and I have eight creases and I'm going to turn it into a fan. I'm going to fold these backward like that. So, uh, right. So that they're they're actually now, you see what I did was I made them so that they're like this, right? So now if I squeeze it at the bottom and I open this up, you know, just, I used to just make a, a staple of it at the bottom, right at the bottom, you can staple it. And then you open it up like this. And you say to the kids, look, I made a fan. This is eight folds in my fan and I can move the air and I can fan myself and cool my craving, cool any distress, cool down, see? But if I were to cut this and take off three pieces of it and say, well, that's something that um, it isn't, um, you know, that that is something that isn't, we already know that. We already have done that. So now when we're practicing, we don't have to be concerned with that. So if I take this and I, and I now staple these three to make, just like I took them off this, I took them away. Okay. Now when I open the fan, I have a minor problem. <laughs> it's very small. And now if I, I want to desperately cool off, I have to go like this, you see. And the more you eliminate and say, well, I already learned that. I don't need that when I'm meditating. You're losing out the idea of, you're losing the idea of the eight fold path because all those pieces should be in, in balance. And when we look at those like down here on our list, we see that um, the, uh, the eight folds, and Erwin did a really good job with this because he said the common name that's been used for a long time was basically the right view, right intention, right speech, right action. But the aspect of harmony, that name, the harmonious perspective, the view of how you look at the world, harmonious imaging, the images you hold in your mind, during the day and harmonious communication instead of bright speech is there because you can communicate with someone with your eyes or movements of the body or just, you know, uh, just a tip of the head, <laughs> any type of movement of the body. You can communicate in many ways other than just speech. So rather than confine it to speech, we open it up to all types of communication right action we take harmonious movement it means harmonious movement of mind's attention where will we place our attention on what's happening in the day harmonious lifestyle instead of livelihood and just talking about the three um sort of dangerous livelihoods that are not good for us like uh making poisons or ammunition or killing things uh, taking an occupation where you're killing things um, or trafficking in human beings was one of them. You don't want to do that because it's harmful. It's hurting people. So instead of taking that one and confining it to occupational things, we look at a broader sense and say harmonious lifestyle will help us where I kind of like to describe a small house I've been to, very small house in the village that does have just two or three rooms and a number of people living there, but they do have a tree in the front yard and they have a bench. And if anybody's sitting there, they're not to be disturbed. So you have a little place where you can go and practice your spiritual uh, practices, uh, even meditation, okay? So it, you're looking at having a job where you have enough time to also develop your spiritual aspect in life. 
so that you're a fully balanced person. What's a fully balanced person? Um, medically speaking today in allopathic medicine to in mental health, they say that a, a balanced human being is a person who is uh, healthy mentally and healthy physically and has a healthy spiritual pursuit. They don't care what it is. That is, unless you live in the Southern Bible Belt in the United States, maybe their test in the hospital will be a little bit strange because when they ask you questions about spiritual pursuits in their testing examinations, they really want specific answers. Not very fair, but I don't think they do that anymore. I think that's gone. All right, now um, the next one is harmonious practice. And we say, uh, where did our practice come from? Where, where did it actually come from? And we have to go back up here on our page and we have to look at the um, four steps of uh, right effort to understand where, where our practice came from. And six R's came from this practice, but the steps of right effort specifically, they were to recognize unwholesome mind states in the mind. Number two, release mind's attention off of the wholesome mind state and relax your head. And then the third step was to bring up a wholesome mind state. And the fastest way to do that is to re-smile as you return to what you're doing. So in life, it's doing a task. Are you working in the office? Are you uh, washing? Are you playing? You minding the kids? Uh, or where are you, what you're doing, or are you meditating? And you left your object of meditation, now you have to return to that object of meditation. And the object of meditation is specifically the point of having an object of meditation in a practice of meditation is to have a recentering point if your attention has moved away. That's what it is, like the anchor that holds the boat so it won't float away while you sleep in the boat overnight. You know, you just have that anchor there, but it doesn't have any other information for you, the object. Okay, then, then the next one is keep the wholesome mind state going that you have, you brought up this wholesome mind state, keep that going, keep practicing your meditation or keep doing the task until it's finished, but keep doing it with a smile and then repeat the cycle whenever you have to, you need it, repeat the cycle. Okay, now the first two steps of this, the right effort is purifying your mind. You, you can see that, you know, that the first, the first two steps are purifying your mind. And then the second two steps, three and four, those are retraining your mind in alignment with the current uh, mental research, you know, the brain research. How does a brain change a habit from unwholesome habit to a wholesome habit through repetition, repetition and training. So whenever you let, this is the key thing that has to happen to change your meditation, to allow your meditation. I don't care what kind you're doing. I, you know, I've had some difficulty getting that across to people. I'm not asking them to stop doing their breathing meditation forever. But if they want to understand what was found here, we're asking them to try metta to learn how this all works. And you are teaching your mind uh, to, when some, to um, let go, relax, smile, and come back. That's the big thing. You're teaching them right effort, your brain. Then if you decide to go and practice with people after it's become automatic for your brain to do these steps automatically, if they, they get that good, if you go and practice breathing meditation, then when something pulls you away, a disturbance happens, probably the brain is going to go, oh, I should just recognize she's pulled away her attention, release, relax, re-smile, return, and, and come back to the breath and come back to the breath like it would come back to anything else. So um, we're not playing a game of what you learned before is bad. No. It's sort of like saying to me, the 10 speed bike I used to ride hundreds of miles 
um, was no good. It was a bad bike. No, actually, it was a very good bike as far as it went. But then when they introduced me to a 21 speed bike or 15 speed bike and then a 21 speed bike, they were magnificent. And I could go 128 miles on a bike ride and come back for the day, you know, without getting exhausted. They were absolutely amazing, the gear systems and stuff and how light the, bo the body of the bike was and the gears and everything. So it's a matter of seeing whether changing a few little things in a person's practice can actually help them to drop deeper, see more clearly, and understand better what the Buddha was talking about in the, in the comprehension part of the Dhamma. And if they are, good. And if they don't want to try this, that's a good too. It's okay, fine. So, um, so the next one, uh, you see how right effort is so important and how it's the part that actually frees your mind out. Nick, go back up here. Let's see, I'm trying to go from the front. So these are your 37, and then you have the first one is four foundations of mindfulness. Wait, that's where I was actually trying to go tonight. <laughs> four foundations of mindfulness. In looking at this, I've read this through about three, four times this week, and I come out the other end every single time I do this. That one of the biggest things that was happening at, at the bottom of the deductive reasoning, starting up here and going down, 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 down at the bottom. What is happening in the present moment? What essentially is happening in the present moment and is the nature of it? And the biggest message here is this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is just what this is. That seems to be the biggest message. And why wouldn't he be saying that? Because um, you're trying to see things as they actually are. So you're seeing what is essential as essential, what is unessential as unessential. If I'm saying to you, stay on your object of meditation, I'm saying, let everything else go, right? If I say to you, can you contemplate a feeling just as a feeling and not take it personally or go into detailed, critical, investigative analysis of a feeling to go further than saying feelings, those three kinds of feelings, when they come up first in, in, in Vedana are just feelings. Can you do that? As an experiment, try it. That's what I'm, I'm trying to encourage a person to do, you see. Can you contemplate the body um, as detailed as it is and everything? Can you get it down to the point where it goes into, if we look at this properly, the body, we would say, I think it's in the body contemplation, we would say basically what this is, is simply there's a bag with an opening at both ends full of many sorts of grain such as hill rice, red rice, beans and peas and millet and white rice. And a man with good eyes were to open it and review this. He would say, this is hill rice, this is red rice, these are beans, these are peas, this is millet, this is white rice. That's what you would do. So when we look at the body, we open it up, we see a heart, we see a liver, we see intestines, we see lungs, we see the circulatory system and take it apart even more. We find the arteries, we see the veins, we find the tiny veins that love to give us little purple marks when we get older on our legs, on the surface, right under the skin. When we're not exercising as much as we should, that's what happens, you see. But these things are just what they are. And in the case of uh, the body, there's these impurities inside. So when we take apart the body, how did he take apart the body? And he simply said, memorize, and people want to know what to memorize. This is memorizing the Dhamma. So you take this and you start reciting it. In this body, there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, and skin flesh, sinews, bones, and bone marrow, kidneys, and heart, and liver. There's diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, the mesentery, contents of the stomach. There's feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, 
tears, grease and spittle, snot, oil of the joints and urine. That's the whole body, folks. That's all he's saying. It's what it is. He's just not trying to be gross with you, not trying to get you upset. He's just trying to tell you that's all this is. And he's wanting you just to see it as it is. So it's a big lesson contemplating the body as a body, seeing it externally and how it operates and seeing it internally as well and thinking about it in terms of it's not me, it's not mine, it is not myself, just contemplating it as a body, nothing else, you see? So this was an exercise of relinquishment of this is my body, my heart, my this, my that, this is mine. And as soon as we say it's mine, there's a, it's a story about the man who had, what's the danger of money? Well, once I buy a really, really expensive something, or like a car, then I want to have an alarm system on it to protect it, to, and I have to worry about somebody stealing it and it keeps go on and on and on. But when you start relinquishing and abandoning everything, um, as a nun, I probably have more stuff than most nuns because I write and I take care of the business for the center and <laughs> there's organization, there's a printer sitting beside me and a computer and Bunty makes a good story. When he's reading one of the suttas, he's talking about how the monk is free to move like a bird and go from place to place. And he's talking about that in all of a sudden, and he'll say something like, and then he travels here and he travels there. And along with him comes the cart with the computer and the, you know, the printer and the paper and the books and this and that, you know. And that's actually what happened. Because sometimes I can grab a tiny bag and just go away for a few days. It feels really good. But if I move a location for me, I have to take the books and the records for the research and the printer and all kinds of things with me. But most of the stuff, it, 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 yeah, you see? But it's a game of living a life where you just decide to believe wherever you go, there you are. And when you eat, it's not being special and specific about your food, it's this is food. As long as there's not something in there that you're allergic to, you're, you're fine. And if it tastes terrible, the advice, many monks will tell you this, is get a banana or hope there's a banana with it, cut it up and put it in and then just eat. It is energy for the body, it will keep you going. We have passed the point of connoisseurs for different international cuisines. <laughs> We have accept, accepting and it works fine until you're a little bit older, like me, sometimes you have to deal carefully with spices and stuff, but in general, I know if I don't eat, I don't get to keep living, so it's not a problem. Yep. Okay. When they did the charnel ground, they did the, let's start at the beginning of this. They did it in the beginning of the Satipatthana. They're talking about feeling as feelings and mind as mind and mind objects as mind objects and, and, um, uh, and the body as the body. And they're looking at the four things, having put away any covetousness and grief for the world. You're just simply fully aware and mindful of what it is you're doing. And it all comes back, if you keep going down like this to the bottom, it all comes back to what? It comes back to the present time, what you're doing in the present time. And then you translate this, you look at what's happening with the 37 pieces are different ways of supporting you to discover this. So if we were to look at the, um, the we're looking at the first one, and these are all the new pasanas. Uh, the Kaya Nupasana, the Vedana Nupasana, the Chitta uh, Nupasana, the Dhamma Nupasana is the practice of understanding the body, the feeling, the mind, and the consciousness. And then later on, after you live your life, if you go to 143, 
in the book and you look at that, what is Sariputta teaching Anathapindika when he leaves life when he's dying, what is he teaching him to do at the end? He is teaching him after his whole life spent helping the Buddha all those years, he's going to teach him to let go, right? And so the whole recitation in 143 is starting out, I will not cling to the body. Uh, I, will, I will not, let's see, it was the very first one in here. I think it's on um, I will not cling to the eye. He starts with the six sense doors. I will not cling to the eye and my consciousness will not um, my consciousness will not be dependent on my uh, on the eye. So he's letting go of my eye. See? I will not cling to the forms and my consciousness will not be dependent on the forms. I will not cling to eye consciousness and my conscious and my consciousness will not be dependent on eye consciousness. I will not cling to contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on eye contact. I will not cling to uh, feeling and my consciousness will not be dependent on feeling. So the person is letting go, letting go, letting go of the desperation to continue the body operating the way it was, where we were holding on to all these pieces. And he's allowing, he's teaching Anathapindika how to leave. So this was interesting because someone came the other day and said, yeah, well, the Buddha teaches this, but he doesn't teach any of this. And I said, wait, whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> he teaches us how to live successfully. He also teaches us how to die in, in a co more comfortable position, aware of everything that's happening, conscious of it, okay, and sort of with grace and dignity. We have a practice to die with. That's what we have here. So after he talks about the eye, he talks about the ear, the nose, the tongue, okay? And then he talks about the body and about the mind, all through those. It's a long recitation, but it's short. It's a very short phrase. And then he says, I will not cling to uh, the consciousness of each one and then to the, then to the contact and then to the, uh, the feeling. That's how far it goes, okay? Then he goes into, I will not cling to the earth element. My consciousness won't be dependent on the earth element. And everything you know is about that, you lay there and think about. And then I will not cling to the water element. I, my consciousness will not be dependent on that. I will not cling to the fire element. I will not cling to the air element or the space element, yeah? And I will not cling to the um, consciousness element and the co my consciousness will not be dependent upon the consciousness element. This is how I will train. Then he takes the aggregates and see this is like giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away, giving away. There's nothing left. You're just there in comfort, staying with this, this body until it is over. And how does someone die? So I, I went back to some friends of mine who were nurses and their whole life and they taught nurses for a number of years. And one of the questions in the hospital always happens is where is the worst suffering happening in the hospital? Of course, nurses think about this as they're being trained to be nurses as well. And, and what happens is that you would think it would be where the people are dying or you would think it would be where the emergency room has got to be the place, but they would end up saying every time the same thing. They would say, the worst suffering is happening in the obstetrics ward where the babies are being born. That's where you hear the most long, steady going on suffering to give birth to the babies. When people are dying on this wing or that wing, if they're there to die, Dying is not difficult. You want to die? I can have you experience dying. You take a breath in, you take a breath out. You take a breath in and you let it out and you don't take another breath. 
And actually, if you're knowledgeable about the body the way we're teaching you, it's not such an upsetting thing to see that this casing is getting old and eventually will not be so useful anymore. And that's what's happening. And the energy inside is going to move out into you can live with the universal consciousness or the universal energy in the uh, in the, co the cosmos. And then the energy from action that occurred flows into some other being in another form or some other place. That's not too hard to see that that's probably what's going on here. Absolutely, I'm not gonna go there, <laughs> you know? Everybody has to figure that out for themselves and there are practices to do that too. But, um, okay, when you come into Satipatthana, you're seeing, you use the mindfulness of breathing. Um, and the mindfulness of breathing is to experience the body and to understand the body. And the rise and fall of the diaphragm is a way to see breathing and experience the body. But still, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And the I shall breathe out, I shall breathe in. He trains and he observes and he's observing. He's not concentrating on the breath. He's observing the breath. And then the four postures that we look at, being aware of sitting, being aware of standing, being aware of walking, being aware of lying down. But again, these are very simple, basic awareness practices. They aren't meant to, for you to go way deep into excessive, uh, you know, um, explanation of that it's not usually there and then the impersonal nature of the body parts that we just did by reciting the parts of the body and incidentally when they're making someone a monk or making someone a nun we're shaving your head and shaving your hair and while we're doing that you're reciting the parts of the body and this is not me this is not mine this is not myself this is just what the body is, okay? So we see the body as it is uh, contemplated and then the contemplation of feeling. And once again, look at how this is not tucked in, not really detailed. It's getting into, I, just realizing that this being is experiencing a pleasant feeling, a painful feeling, or a neither pleasant nor painful feeling. And understanding how these work is what the teaching is about as you go along in your practice and understanding the difference between experiencing worldly feelings and unworldly feelings and what, how indifference operates does the feeling still occur the same way? And not understanding how any of this operates was considered to be ignorance. Ignoring that the suffering that you go through in life has a cause and has a cessation and has a way to reach the cessation. So these are the, these are the, uh, the way that they're dealing with this. And, and then, going and taking a look at the hindrances that occur. Now, the one thing we're finding out about the hindrances is we go through the text gradually and we're looking, um, this is in the Saturday class of going through and examining step-by-step step the hindrances that are in the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya. We're up to like the, I think the third one now, we're gonna look at 22 this coming Saturday. Um, When anything arises as a hindrance, the key piece about hindrances, the key instruction for it throughout the text, even in the Bhairavarawa Sutta, even in number four, where it was saying, if you have trepidations of fear when you sit in the jungle, 
you have a lot of fear coming up, then what you should do is embrace the contradiction. What's the contradiction? I will be fearless and sit in the, in the jungle. I was fearful and now I will take an affirmation. Affirmations are firming up a statement with the brain and then sitting and remembering the affirmation you said, I will sit and I will be fearless. If I was sitting with lust, I will be uncovetous. I will sit without lust. So saying that and then sitting again helps you. And again, this is about learning communication with the brain, with the brain and with what you're doing in your meditation. So is meditation just watching something? Actually, it's learning to communicate with your brain and seeing if your brain will respond to what you request for it to happen, okay? So this is where we're spending time just today is in the, in the foundations of mindfulness. We're not gonna go any, any further to that. Um, let me see, okay, there, back. And then in the sutta for the Satipatthana, it goes on and it examines the six bases, uh, which are the six sense doors, but What it's talking about is abandonment again in that section. This is in section 40. And it's talking about the five aggregates in this way. You're contemplating things internally and externally, internally and externally, but you're abiding independent, not clinging to anything in the world. Not clinging, why? Because it's not me, it's not mine, it's not myself. I used to tell you before when I was learning all this stuff in the beginning, uh, I had signs all over my trail. I was in a little trail, I have to understand. When I chose to do this, I'll tell you why I chose to do it. I was willing to do it. It was the least expensive way for me to have a place to stay was to get this little trailer and it was 25 feet long and it was eight feet wide, okay? And so the little middle part of it, you know, on either side, there's like little closets and uh, tables and, uh, you know, the little tiny kitchen with water in it. And the books I took away, the, I removed the couch, I had it taken out and I had a desk put in there with cabinets over top for all the books and stuff we needed and everything. Okay, and then I have a little bed and a little uh, bathroom that was actually hooked up. We were, for a few years before that, we were just with outhouses living in the forest with these outhouses, which were special. <laughs> they were wonderful. And they were clean too, because we had, we had lumber mills and we could get sawdust and you just put sawdust on top of anything that you do and there's no, no smell and there's no uh, dirt, there's no spiders, no bugs, nothing. All you need is from the sawmill, you need the, the uh, sawdust and you're all set. So living in this little trailer, I had my little world. And then there was a porch that I built in front of the trailer. But when I opened my door, I had the whole world for the rest of my house. That's the way it worked. And the reason I could accept this mentally and physically when I did this in this little tiny trailer was because I saw the movie Alien with Sigourney Weaver before I went to Missouri. See, that's what it was. If you remember, she had this horrible experience on another planet with a monster. And then she comes back to the corporation. When she comes back to the corporation, it's about her and her cat. You see, she and her cat live in this tiny little cubicle inside this building that the corporation keeps her in when she's not flying one of these big space vehicles, see? And in my mind, I was Sigourney Weaver and I just got in the trailer, everything's fine. I didn't have a cat, that's okay, but it was perfect. And if I wanted more space, I could open the door and I had just what's behind me, a whole forest like that right there. And that was my big space. So when I had the concept of having a house with space in it before, wasn't necessary, didn't bother me at all. But I had a ceiling over my bed and I could reach up and touch it like this. 
So before I went to bed each night, I put signs and stuff on the ceiling. And that's where I started to learn the Dhamma. And you get up on the bathroom door here, there's a sign inside. I, oh, the other thing I did was I decided to live without mirrors. I, I thought the best way to let go of yourself was to just not see yourself. <laughs> so I didn't have a mirror anywhere. Why did I have to have a mirror? What's the whole thing about the mirror? I was curious. So no bathroom mirror, no mirror on the bathroom door, no mirror on any door. It's all covered with signs. <laughs> Uh, signs about the precepts, the hindrances, the schedule for the center, any information I have to give anyone, uh, anything you needed. I, I originally thought when he said I needed to live in a small space, I would go crazy, but thank you, Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> that was it. She saved me, you know, with this movie. Anyway, coming back to this, looking at the five aggregates once again, you are abiding, contemplating mind objects. You are contemplating what they are like when they are affected by clinging. Now, this, oh, this is an interesting thing because contemplating my, mind objects is mind objects in terms of the five aggregates affected by clinging. So we have to say if or when affected by clinging, right? Because if you understand the basics of suffering and how it works, you know that clinging is what irritates the whole situation very, very badly. You see, I like it, I want it, that's, that's the, um, or I don't like it, I don't want it, that's the craving. But the moment you get into the story of why you don't like it and the mental proliferation thinking, this is like what happened before. It must be the same thing. The same thing is going to happen. Okay, that's the clinging. Now, the question this says in here, the person abides contemplating mind objects. Those are thoughts that arise in terms of the five aggregates, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness affected by clinging but it doesn't say if or when but if you go and examine this it's trying to say if it's clinging it's a problem so you need to look and understand how it was so how does the monk abide contemplating the mind objects in terms of the five aggregates affected by clinging he understands such as material form such its origin such its disappearance now there's the that is the four noble truths popping up right there see the 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 um such is the feeling and such is the origin of it how it the cause of it and the disappearance of it is the cessation and then you take those four noble truths and you apply them to each one of the pieces the body the feeling perception the thoughts and the consciousness into each one okay and in this way, he abides contemplating uh, independent, not clinging to anything in the world because he begins to realize as he's testing this, what it's like if you cling and how you cannot get, a, you can't stay in the present time, you're still clinging. Because remember, anicca means you're moving all the time. And when you're moving all the time, you miss my new little car, here you go. You're moving all the time like this. When something happened here and you're past it, you're not letting it go if you're still thinking about it or else you have to open this up and you have to put it inside here and carry it with you. And that's why you feel pressure. That's why you have a headache. That's why you feel you just can't take it anymore. There's too many things happening to you. Oh, and that's when we start wondering, is anything happening to us at all? Ooh, what if, what if nothing is happening to us hmm, and everything is happening from us? That would be the trained mind. <laughs> that's the trained mind to understand that everything that's occurring through feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness is not happening to us we have something called volition and our volition allows us choice and the choice we make is to cling or not to cling 
That is the Buddhist question. Will I cling or will I not cling to this? And if we let it go and say, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself, then we get free from the clinging. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. So once again, we're back to home base, abandon, 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 everything. I did not like the Clooney movie where there was a movie called The Perfect Storm and Clooney just had to stay in the boat when it sank. And I thought to myself, that's ridiculous. Everybody else got off the boat, grabbed a piece of wood or anything. But Clooney, he stayed in the boat and stood in the doorway like this, holding it here and here. And the boat tipped and then it went down. And George Clooney died in the film. And I'm like, that's crazy. How could he do that? You know, this is not right. But he went down with the ship. Okay, fine. He didn't know you're not supposed to cling to the ship. You're supposed to let go and go away from the ship before it goes down. Well, we're the same way. Our little car going along like this is just going along and it's moving along just fine until you fill it up with stuff. And then it's like in an ocean. And then, uh oh, there it goes. It sank. That's another breakdown. You got to be careful of these things. You don't carry around what's already passed. You can look at it from the perspective of it, what just happened while you're in the present time, but don't carry around the weight of anything that has gone on in the past. Just let it go. Smile, come back, stay in the present time. That's what we're trying to show you. The seven enlightenment factors are, are part of this. So we're gonna look at that another time. And then um, the Four Noble Truths, they put it way back here. I don't know why they do that, but that's the way Satipatthana was written. It's way back in there. But the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, I think the biggest thing, uh, and it's funny, the Four Noble Truths are not part of the 37 requisites, are they? Isn't that funny? They're not. But the Four Noble Truths is over that whole thing, and the, seven, the 37 requisites of enlightenment are part of the discovery system for understanding how everything actually works. But the Four Noble Truths, once again, I've taught you this before, but the Four Noble Truths are not just a summary of what the Buddha taught, which is very popular, okay? The second use of it we should point out is that it was it was his, the Buddha's personal map for personal investigation. That's how he was investigating suffering, the cause, the um, cessation, and the way to that cessation to make it longer and longer. You see, that's the, that's the, the way he was uh, uh, pursuing it himself. Then third one is it was his teaching method. So when you take apart the, all of the 152 suttas in the, in the Nimejima Nikaya, if you start fooling around with it and just making a little note on each one, which of the Four Noble Truths are in this sutta, you're going to find a sutta that is showing you suffering and the cessation of it. Then you find one suffering, cessation, and path. You find suffering and cause and cessation. You'll find that's what's happening for the framework of each one of the lessons, okay? And then when he's teaching it to other people, it's his methodology for teaching it. So almost any piece, well, you, you should play with this, any piece of the 37 requisites you take, take a look at it methodically using the steps of the Four Noble Truths to see whether there is suffering and a cause and a cessation. It has anything to do with these pieces as you go along. Okay, I wanna take questions for just a minute here um, before we go any further into this. And it's gonna take a, a, few, a, a few weeks because we're gonna go through and pick at these sections, you know, in here. So if we were to look at it, I think, if I go back to the screen again like this, 
you see, we went through this one, the foundations of mindfulness. Okay, now next time we can take a look at the spiritual powers and see how they were working. Um, this, the spiritual powers. Yeah, it was always a bummer. Okay, <laughs> let me see. Wait a minute. I might have to rewrite this because I know way back then we looked at them and just said faith, energy, mindfulness, and collectedness. Collectedness is productive concentration. All right, so we'll just go one by one through these and we'll look at them. And then if you have anything to say about them, pop up with some things that you've observed about them. And then the next one would be the faculties, but we'll take the faculties and we'll take um, the, um, the spiritual powers and the spiritual faculties in the same breath. We will take it in one lesson. So that's three. And then we will take this one because it's our practice and we'll look at what it was saying originally in the text and how come, I want you to just think about something. When we go into this one, I want you to consider how did that get lost? What happened to it? How did it get lost for so long? Because it you know, bothered me when I saw what was happening with our students and how brilliant this was and how the progress was happening so easily for them. I wanted to understand what in the world happened to this. I want you to think about it. What could have happened to this that it got lost? Of course, 2,600 years, it's a long time. Give you my grandmother's cake mix, probably by now or telling me to use the wrong kind of oil or the wrong kind of flour or something that the cake won't work anymore and I can't make the cake. Same example, some recipe that uh, you know, there are recipes for cakes when you're cooking certain cakes are like 12 inches high. But in order to get them 12 inches high, the ingredients for the cake, and there's usually six ingredients. It's a funny thing with cake mixes, but when you make them, there's usually six pieces. And in the case of the, uh, of the, of the cake mix, if you don't have the blending instructions for one of those cakes that used to get like this high, then the problem is your cake isn't going to come out the same way, no matter what you do, because there was some kind of secret involving the blending instructions. And that's something to consider about this. Long time, 2,600 years. Then you go past the powers, then you go through the, uh, the Bojanga, and it's fun to go through the Bojanga and look more closely at it and try to think of ways that you can remember it. So we came up, there was a little statement. Oh, that was a good one. That was the real short one. I remember we worked on this. We came up with a real short statement that you could remember all the pieces. We were trying to shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it. <laughs> and get to a small statement that would help you to remember all those pieces. And if you could remember to say it this way, I think it's two sentences, yeah, all seven pieces are there. And then also as we're going through these, I want you to take a look personally at how can they be interwoven together? How can they, um, turn into one quilt, one blanket, instead of all separate pieces, because that's what happens. They are all woven together. Okay, questions.